Guys, if you're an EastEnders fan, you are going to love today's episode because I've got with me the Albert Square legend, Mr. Dean Gaffney. Now, Dean played Robbie Jackson for nearly a thousand episodes of the show and he's here with me in Dubai and he's going to tell all. Dean, welcome. Thank you for having me, mate. You know, I, I don't know if you know, you know, I, I just said then that uh, you've been on nearly a thousand episodes. Uh, I, 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 just, I just Googled Wiki it before. Wikipedia. Yeah, I just Googled it before we came here. Do you know how many it is? Do you know what the, the maddest thing is, the saddest thing is, is that when you get to a thousandth episode, they come down, the, the, you know, the powers to be come down, they'll bring some flowers, they'll make a big fuss of you. And I was there, my first thing, because I've, I've actually been back and forth like a yo-yo now, probably on EastEnders five or six times, probably the most of any actor or actress on the show. So my first stint was just under 11 years. And I think I probably would have got to like, I don't know, 700 or something. And then I went back and did, but the thing is, because East Dennis is four times a week, it's very easy to rack up them episodes if you're in them. I mean, it's not, it's not, unless you're Danny Dyer and you're in, you know, the Queen Vic, you're not going to be in every episode. So you, I think Perry Fennick, uh, who plays Billy in East Dennis, got it the last time I was there. I think he did a thousandth episode, but he was there like 18 years. So it depends on how many times you're in. 18 show. straight years. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'll tell you anyway, it's 978. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. You're probably even more annoyed than you were before yes, you started telling me. I am now. <laughs> so let's, let's rewind to uh, cause when you first went on. Had you, had you always wanted to be an actor as a kid? Went to, I went to, uh, well, I went to a normal secondary school. Uh, and then I remember doing a show. There was me and four girls and we did like a, a George Michael tribute for like one of our school assemblies. And, I th and the headmaster and the, the drama teacher at the time took my mum and dad at parents' evening and said, look, you know, Dean's got a talent. I think that's what he said. Dean's got a talent and, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, you should channel it. Maybe bring, you know, bring him into like Saturday school, like maybe get him involved in the drama club. But me being me, that was it full on. I was like, no, you know, the, the kind of, I want a golden egg and I want it now. So I kind of said, no, let's just, like, I'd always watch things like fame on the TV. So I was like, you know what? I want to go to a drama school. So my parents, you know, me being the precocious child, put me into a, a drama school, which was Sylvia Young. And uh, well, I went to another drama school first um, called Raven's Court, which I didn't really have a very good time there because you, you actually got corporal punishment there. Really? I've never actually said that before, but... You're showing your age now, aren't you? Yeah, but the, <laughs> you know what the weirdest thing is? That's the thing, it was in the 90s, and I remember saying to my family, like, this isn't normal. Like, I haven't done anything wrong, I'm not a bad pupil, and I'm, and I'm getting the... It was the ballet slipper. And... Um, was it still allowed back then? That's though? what I mean, because it was a private school, you could... They could get away with it, but I kind of, at the time, re massively rebelled against it, because it's like... You know, you weren't in the era where my parents were born and that was the norm. You know, times move on. And I kind of rebelled against that in the sense of that's not normal. That's not normal. It's not normal for uh, someone to do that to pupils. You know, under, what was I? I was probably 13, 14 years old. It just, for me, it just was not the norm. So we left that drama school. And then I went to uh, Sylvia Young Theatre School, which you know, changed my life. It was a mad experience. So on a Monday and a Tuesday and a Wednesday, you do normal education. And then Thursday and Friday, it turns into like a fame school. People walking around the corridor, singing, dancing, twirling. You had amazing people there. I was, you know, same year as Emma Bunton, Baby Spice. You know, some really, really good people uh, come from that school. Billy Piper, Amy Winehouse, you know, there's some amazing talent. Um, and then me. How long were you there for? Did you did you actually see it through to No, no, I was there, no, luckily it was a weird experience. So I was there from 14 to 15. Then EastEnders um came knocking, but I was actually at my friend's house, my mate John Pickard, who was in a show at the time called 2.4 Children. And he'd always been working, he was a massive child actor. And uh I was at his house, his mum and dad own a pub uh um in Labbert Grove, Nine Hill, in London. And uh it was an amazing experience to like live at, I was practically living at his really, because uh, where we lived, where I lived in Surrey, it was kind of longer to commute to, to the school, but staying at John's quite a lot of nights, but you, you grew up quite quickly because he had a pub. And, uh, you know, 
his pub was the house as well. The house was next door, so the, you were allowed in the pub. So, you know, 15, 16, this pub, and he got a phone call from Sylvia Young saying, um, John, you know, you've got an audition for EastEnders tomorrow. And he said, oh, I'm with Dean Gaffney at the moment. She, she actually said, oh, just send him along as well. And and then I, I had, they took an interest in me, but the thing about that process is when you're making a family on EastEnders, you have to go through loads of auditions. And it gets narrowed down, narrowed down, narrowed down. And obviously they're piecing together the family. You know, the, the, the great thing is that we all, the Jackson family, we all shared different fathers or mothers, so we all look different. Uh, obviously, I don't look like Patsy who played Bianca and vice versa. So it was it was it was nice because it was like they were forming this family, and I had to go back. I remember five or six times, and then the last time I finally got it. But on the last time that I got it, where EastEnders is filmed, it's filmed at Elstree Studios. At the time, they were doing Top of the Pops. So you'd go there and you'd see like a massive queue for like, take that. And, and then when, you know, when I had my audition, I had to wait and see if I got the next recall. And you go and sit in the bar and you've got people like, you know, Robbie Williams sat there and, you know, when take that had just formed. Because I obviously joined EastEnders in 93. So, you know, it's nearly 30 years ago now. Were you a fan of the show before? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I, I think people seemed to not realise how big EastEnders was back in 93. You know, you had four channels. You had, you know, people like Dirty Den, Angie, Grant Mitchell, Phil Mitchell. You know, it was a massive show. I mean, one one episode of EastEnders on Christmas Day, I think it was in 80, 86 or whatever, got when Den served the divorce papers on Angie, you know, it got 30 million people watch that episode one episode that's half the country so i'd always been a fan of it you know it's east enders i was you know 15 years old it was the prime audience for, i suppose going up and um you know to get that audition is just you know life-changing which it has been you know when there's a massive storyline like that you know like um serving the divorce papers or somebody gonna die or get written out do you guys all know about it or do they try and keep it as secret as possible so it doesn't make the press no they uh, they've only started doing that towards the end of my reign on the show you know and the thing the second time I went back they started taking scripts uh, or pages out at the end where it was the live episode actually it was um it was when Steve McFadden went to, there was a scene where he, he was in a live episode of Who uh, Who Killed Lee, Lucy Bill or whatever it was. And it was the live episode and he goes off to East London somewhere in Clare Wharf. And then he meets, um, I think Gillian Telforth, or it might have been Ross Kemp, one of the two. And that was Gillian Telforth. And that was completely like, where no one saw that coming in the script and certainly the audience because it was live they needed to keep it so they are very good like that EastEnders they do uh, try and keep things you know really really kind of confidential but as a normal rule of thumb is we all get the same scripts I mean did you, did you tend to read the script or do people tend to read the whole script or uh, and actually follow the storyline or do you think oh, I'm in that scene I better learn those no, lines there, learn. there's no scope for that if you can imagine that you EastEnders on 52 weeks a year, four episodes a week. You barely know where your own character's going to not worry about other people. Uh, so really, you'll only ever see that when you are doing, they have monitors all around the set and in your dressing rooms where you can see the show being filmed in different studios. And then you would you'd kind of watch and go, oh wow, that storyline's happening. And obviously we all, we're all good friends. So we all talk in, you know, the, there's a green room, everyone talks and whatever. But as a general rule of thumb, you wouldn't really know what's going on in anyone else's storyline because it's not your concern. And how far behind do they work? Or how far ahead rather in terms of if you're filming today, when's it, when's it airing? If you film today, it will then air in six to seven weeks later, okay, nearly, so nearly two months. Quite tight. And, and in, t in terms of, uh, you know, re retakes and, you know, getting for perfection, I mean, I guess, you know, there isn't oodles of time to no. go again and again and again. I mean, what is it like, as long as you don't fuck it up, you know, we'll do it one more time for good luck. Well, and no, it, again, when I first joined, we, had, we were lucky we had uh, rehearsals, which is unheard of now. You don't, you literally rehearse, record, you, you know, try it. If we're doing a scene now, and we're in the, the good thing about EastEnders is it's multi-camera. So there's probably four to six cameras at every scene. So you don't so need to re-record it from different angles? No, because the angles are there. The only time they'll do it is if they're going closer. But, uh, you know, generally there's there's four to six cameras. They whip it out. They do a scene very quick. Um, there's no set time on how many takes you do. Like, you know, you could, 
you, very rarely will you smash out in one because there's always going to be something going wrong. There's either going to be a microphone in shot, or there's, you know, it's very rarely you just do one take. But you do two or three, and then they've obviously got so many cameras, so many different angles that they can cut around it if someone's done something wrong. General rule though is that you would, the, the editor would take anything. So it's best to, if you don't like your performance or something you didn't really like, sometimes it's best to swear um, because they obviously then have to stop filming. So you know, Jesus Christ, the amount of times I was effing blind on EastEnders is, is, is colossal because the amount of times you get it wrong, do you know what I mean? So tell me about that first 11 years, I think your first stint was on, wasn't it? So 1993, you'll have been, what, 17 when you went into the show? 15. 15. And what, um, I mean, when did you first, I guess, feel famous, feel recognised? You when, when did you think, you know, wow, I've, you know, this is really dawning on me what it is? I think from the ground running, you know, really? EastEnders at the time was undoubtedly, you know, the biggest show in the country. And I think the thing about fame, you know, you can be Tom Cruise, the biggest movie star in the world, but he does one film a year. You can be Ross Kemp, Steve McFadden in EastEnders, and you're doing 52 weeks a year, four times a week in people's living rooms, every single week for the last 30 years. You, in a weird way, in our, in our country, you are just as famous, if not more, than someone like Tom Cruise. It's weird, it's, I can't explain it. It's because you're in their living rooms and they feel they know you, it's instantaneous recognition. It's not something that goes where people go, oh, I think I know you, they know you. You're, you're recognized through, even if you've got tinted windows in your car, you recognize it. It's, it's the maddest experience and you can't explain it to anyone who's not been in it. You know, we have reality shows now and we have people that, you know, don't really have much of a talent are on the sh on TV, but at that time, you know, you had to have something. There was no reality, so you had to have either a talent, or you're an actor, or you're a singer, or you're a movie star. That was it, or you're a sports person. Now you you could be anything. I think the big difference back then as well is you know, like you said uh, earlier in this, that there was only four channels back then, and you know, it cut it cuts both ways that you know the the proliferation of social media or or the, or the easy distribution of today, and that yes, you know, if you want to get seen by five hundred million people overnight, you know, it's technically possible on on Instagram, yeah. Facebook, whatever. You know, if you're a if you've got a talent, if you're a good-looking girl, whatever. But there's so many talented people around the world. Obviously, there's so many more untalented people that are just on there as well, but there's so many talented people that even if you are talented, there's easy access for all the other talented people Correct. now as well. Whereas if you you know rewind to when that was on four, I mean not even five channels back then. Yeah, you know, I mean I, I remember it myself. You know, four, four, four channels, and there wasn't even enough content to fill these four no. channels twenty you know twenty four hours a day. And then you know coupled coupled with that, I mean I remember the likes of Smash Hits magazine. Yeah, yeah. Um, was it was big? I think there was a magazine yeah, called Big, big and yeah. all, all loads. Yeah. You know, I'd be you know, 13, 14, 15, fifteen, you know, excited to you know to to go to the newsagent each week to to get a copy. And you know if if you were yeah, if you were famous back then, you'd be on the telly, you'd be in those magazines, but you would, you know, you would be a star in a way that it just it just doesn't exist anymore. No. And that's that's the thing, is is people don't realise, like, you know, obviously, good God, if 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 social media was around when I first joined EastEnders, you know, I'd probably be on or anyone in EastEnders would probably be on fifty million view, uh, uh, followers on Instagram because it's 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 it grows, doesn't it? But it's that ripple effect. But you know, what we had, I suppose, at that time, instead of having social media, we had the press, which were brutal in that time. You know, they were, I mean, you had people like Ali Ross, you had people like Remember Gary these. Bushell. Remember these You names, know, they were yeah. brutal. They attacked your, your, um, your looks. I mean, they attacked everything about everyone on that show. You know, if someone had a slight weight issue, they would call him chubby, or in fact, they'd go as far as saying you're fat. And, you know, I had a few spots when I was 15 years old never had a spot ever since, but I still get sometimes referred to as Spotty Robbie. I mean, it's just, it's mad. And I think the press at the time, and they still do to a certain extent, have a lot to answer for, because they just got away with murder. And what changed for you during those 11 years? You know, did, did you, I don't know, did you enjoy all of the time? Was it ups and downs? Did you kind of, you know, grow in and feel settled? Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, obviously, ultimately, you enjoy earning good money from a young age, you know. It's one thing that, being on a show like EastEnders has given me, it's given me a, a great life, you know. I bought two children out of it, I've got a nice car, nice house, so I'm very lucky. Um, and that's all thanks to that show and everything then that stems off it. But certainly, fundamentally, EastEnders 
changed my life. Who knows where I'd be if I didn't have that show? Would I still be acting? Would I be working in Burger King? Would I, you know, where would I be? Who knows? So, it, you've, you know, I'm always thankful that 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 person, that cast and director, that writer, that producer gave me that job because, like I said, who knows where I'd be? So, going along the eight year, the eleven years, sorry, it, you know, you have you have that fame, fortune. And obviously, you know, a lot of it, press intrusion. I mean, a lot of people blame the press. I don't blame the press. They're doing a job, and you know, you know, most most actors, most people in the media or you know, in the public eye, <coughs> are the first people to buy OK magazine to see if they're in the back pages, or you know, to see. You know, we, we are we we love it, and then we don't love it. So I get I get that thing of press saying, well, you can't have it all ways. You either want it or you don't want it, but. In the early 90s, when I was on EastEnders, the columnists that would write on the show were brutal. Why did you leave after the 11 years? It was it was a mixture of, of, the, of the both, really. They, they wanted the character to grow up. Um, they basically said that Robbie needs, he can't be the bumbling idiot anymore. So, But if you grow up on screen, the audience won't believe it. Uh, because it's just like, you have to be a character that goes off for a few years, comes back and says, oh God, that's Robbie. And then obviously what happens is different producers then come in, they want to take the show into a different direction. I'm then doing other stuff, you know, whether it be I'm a celebrity or working with Ricky Gervais on extras, you know, you do other things. I wanted to tread the boards, did two years doing Calendar Girls on tour, did a, um, a play for Bill Kenwright, which was about Agatha Christie. So where I played like a, a child, uh, well, an adult with learning difficulties. So it was nice to get my teeth into something else. So when it comes to coming back into the show, I mean, obviously you leave it, um, you know, with them saying that they want you back in and, and, and you obviously, you know, hoping that you'll be coming back in at some point as well. I mean, at that point, is it kind of in the lap of the gods or, or do you make a conscious effort or you, you and your agents make a conscious effort over the coming years, you know, to keep yourself, keep yourself remembered? It, it, can, ver it can vary. It depends on how you know, what, what tactics you want to use, you know, the, the, the right way is getting your agent to contact, you know, but in life, if you, as we all know, in everyday shape, you know, in every kind of situation in life, if you're the one asking or wanting, um, they hold all the cards, the other person. So sometimes your agent doesn't want to do that because it then gives them, it gives them the power or gives anyone the power. Um, but in the time that I went, the, the, one of the first times I went back, um, it was Patsy Palmer's uh, Bianca as her leaving do. And I got invited, obviously, to come and see her leaving do. And at the time, there was a producer called Dominic Treadwell Collins, amazing director. Uh, sorry, not director, the producer, but amazing producer, because he's the one that did all the, the live episodes, Who Killed Lucy. And I think that's the last time that the show's really ever seen the biggest viewing figures of, of the modern era because obviously TV has changed. You know, I think it got like 11, 14 million or whatever it was, which no TV show gets those viewers anymore. And um, and I remember seeing Dominic at this party and he looked at me and he went, you look really well, Dean. I said, oh, thanks, Dom, you know, you're doing well on the show. And then he just kept looking at me and he was like, okay, we need to be in touch. And that, my comeback on that era came back from simply seeing him in a party. And I think and then it jogs people's memories. And I think that's sometimes a better thing to do than than asking outright, because if you ask outright, yeah. predominantly people get the word no. It's about boxing clever and and putting yourself in situations that you're you're di they're looking at you from a different angle. How long were you on for on that stint when you went back then? Then I went back for four years. Oh, really? So obviously during that time, you mentioned that uh, you you'd done some reality TV. Uh, I mean, how how. How does it differ, and I was going to say, does it differ wildly to something like EastEnders, given that uh, you've got your multi-camera setups and, 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 you, and you're doing it all quite quick? I mean, look, obviously, I know one's reality and one's, one's scripted, uh, but, you know, I would, I would imagine there'd be huge differences between, uh, you know, a, let's say a movie, a heavily rehearsed, a, a, you know, a heavily scripted thing, but when you kind of just jump in and jump in out, do you, do you find it kind of set you up for it? Well, I think, I think the, the first thing that's completely different is how you would approach getting that job. You know, when I go for an interview with EastEnders, obviously I've been brought up well with two loving parents that, you know, 
would reprimand me if I was ever disrespectful to them or anyone else. So, you know, I'm always on my P's and Q's. So if I go through an interview for, say, EastEnders or an audition, you know, you, you show that you've been brought up well, you've been polite, everything's manners, 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 and you're just being respectful, you just would like the job. Whereas of my interview for I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of It is very different because they want you to be not controversial, but they want to know that when they're sticking a camera on you for 24 hours, you're going to talk. You're not just going to sit there mute. So it's a very different audition process. For the jungle, you have to be quite laddish, out, you know, quite chatty. And I remember from my interview, they said, oh, you know, can you, can you tell any secrets? I said, well, get me on the show and I'll tell all. I'm never going to tell all. Um, but it's it's kind of massaging their you know the egos. It's it's kind of you know uh, giving them something for them to give you something. Whereas a, a, an audition process for a drama or a soap opera or any show to do with acting is completely different. Um, but the reality side has also been great. I've always said I wouldn't do you know shows that are being made at the moment just for being made. You know whether it's you know go and do something with a pig on the farm or go and, you know, go and run a hundred miles for no reason, just on some obscure TV channel. You know, I don't want to do that. I'm an actor ultimately. And even if acting dries up, I'd rather stick to that. Obviously if, you know, the big hitters, obviously I've done The Jungle, but if Strictly come dancing knocks on your door, you have to, you have to accept, you know, you have to seriously consider it because it's a very different vehicle. There's a there's a hierarchy in was well, that the platform reality. is that platform it gives you again for your, for your you know for your next show. But it's, all, next it's also credible, you know. I don't want to be, you know. You have to be box clever about what you turn down and what you accept. It's very easy to accept the power note. We all money makes the world go round. We all have to earn money, and I, I you know I still have to put the Christmas presents under the tree for my daughters every year, but. Ultimately, you also have to think of forward thinking and what you will accept and what you won't. And I just wouldn't do, you know, a really, really show that would harm me, do you know what I mean, or harm my reputation. So, Strictly Come Dancing, of course, it's, it's the mecca, isn't it? But, you know, it's all about what, what, what you, you kind of want, where you want to see your career going. Because like I said, it's very easy to be one of them, you know, reality people that may get wheeled in and wheeled out for every show that's going, but you lower your, you, I suppose you lower what your commodity, what you're about. I mean, if you could write your own ticket now to, you know, to go and do something tomorrow, I mean, would it be going back into EastEnders or, or you know, would it be a mainstream acting piece? I think it, it, the easy option is to say go back to EastEnders because it's, it's 10 minutes up the road from where I live. It's my family, it's my home, I love the people there, you know. So, of course, that would be the dream. And, you know, that's that's most people's pensions that are there on the long long term. And it is, it is home. Like, whether you go in there and you speak to the lady on the help desk, whether you speak to the cleaners, whether you speak to the makeup artists, the costume designers, it's all a family. Um, but obviously, to think outside the box, it would be nice to, you know, I want to do something where I have to shave my head and you know, do something completely different where people go, oh my God, that was Dean Gaffney last night in that show. Do you know what I mean? Did it never um, tempt you to uh, to go and try and break it in America? And look, I mean, people that are not in the acting profession will always say, you know, <clears throat> why don't you, so the famous one is, why don't you just go into Carnation Street or why don't you just go, and, go into America? I mean, if it was that easy, Matt, we'd all be doing it. Mm. It's not that easy just to piss off to America and be a star out there. I mean, if you make it in America, you hang up your boots, you know, you, you, you're goners. Um, but it's not it's not that easy, you know, they they fundamentally, you know, I would probably play like a character actor, whereas fundamentally in America, it's all about, you know, looking absolutely a million dollars. And obviously the characters I would play would be a bit more kookier. So it, it, it to be honest, I'd rather crack England and just do successful in the country that I was born in, do you know what I mean? As opposed to going to America and trying to smash it out. And also I've got, you know, I've got family, I can't just, you know, 
at the time that I would want to have done that, my daughters were too young for me just to go up and leave. I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, but I asked the question more because I, I, I remember, you know, back in the day, both people I knew or people I would know of because you'd see them in the in the press or in the magazines, or whatever. You know, would be people who who were you know well into a very very successful stint in something UK based. You know, whether it was a an East End as a Hollyoaks or or, or or just on your kind of regular BBC telly, and you, yeah, and you know, as a, as a UK person, they're probably you know at the top. Or very much near, near, near the top of what they could do and could you know coast along earn good money and, put, and probably stay famous for the rest of their lives and then you, you see them leave uh, because you know you know they want to go and try it in America and obviously you know they have to go back to I mean lesson stage one you know let, you know <laughs> looking for an agent probably you know starting all those basic auditions 99 out of 100 uh, you know get nowhere with it come back to England by the time they come back to England the time the time's moved on there's you know there's, there's somebody else and they can't even you know they can't even pick up where they left off and it must be uh, I always wonder what's you know and, and there's no right or wrong answer but I always wonder what goes through people's minds at that time you know wh whether or not you know they think right I've done what I want to do here I've, I've got to take that shot you know regardless of whether or not I do or don't make it or if they're just very deluded about the position you know, because they are famous in the UK and they, and they think that translates like for life yeah. into America but it's an interesting psyche. It is, I mean I think if, if you know you're on a TV show in England you get six figures, if you're on a TV show in America you get seven, you know you, it's, it's a completely different vehicle so I think it's it's a, it's a, listen, you know, we all, I want to be successful in the career that I've chosen, whether that's in England or America you know, who really cares? So what does the future hold for you now? Well, the future holds for me at the moment I'm going to enjoy myself in Dubai it's a hard one with, with, with my profession because people, you know, when your agent picks up the phone to cast directors at the moment, it would always be, hey, yeah, yeah, we know what Dean's about and we'll, we'll get back to you. But it's like, no, you don't know what Dean's about. You know what Robbie's about. You know that I can play a character who's walked around Albert Square with a dog for 20 years, 30 years, but you don't actually know what I'm actually capable of. And it just needs that break. It needs someone to go take a chance on them, do you know what I mean? And that's all we want as actors, is someone just to take a chance. And you know, every every door you knock on, it's, it might be slammed shut, but at some point, a door will open. And you just got to have faith in that. And I've been very lucky that I've had good money over the years that's kept me in a position where I don't need to necessarily worry. And when it does get to the point where it's like, oh, this is worrying, you know, someone up there looks down on me and goes, no, we'll sort you out and I get another job again. So it's just, you know, we're, I think a lot of the population are in the same boat. You know, you just, we're all just trying to survive. You mentioned walking around Albert Square with a dog. I'm sure, I'm sure every, every EastEnders fan listening or watching what, what wants, to, wants to know some dog stories. I mean, how, how many dogs did you have during that time? <coughs> we had four, I think, in total. It was all part of the same family. Four, four dogs at the same time, or you mean during your tenure? During the, during the tenure, oh. there, there was, it was, but there was all, it was all part of the same family. Um, you know, siblings or the, the, the you know, the, the son or the dad or the, or the mom or whatever. And, and, um, I mean, some of the dogs were on 101 Dalmatians. One of the dog was on Gladiator. Um, so when I was when I was popped up a few places, <coughs> it was actually a guy called John York that devised that character. He, he'd um, growing up, he'd had a dog and. He had this vision that he always wanted to call a dog Wellard. And I didn't think he realised how successful that dog would have gone on to be because, you know, that's the one thing that things are always shouting at me in the street is where's Wellard? I mean, it's, it's th every day, 365 days a year for the last 30 years. That's all I hear. Uh, and I'm not knocking it because it's a nice tagline to have, but, or to be known for something. But <clears throat> I remember they were going to do a story where they want. They needed to kill when Dominic took over. Actually, they they needed to kill the dog off, because the dog in dog years now would be like ten, you know, five hundred and sixty-two. Uh, and but John York, when he was there, he was like over my dead body. He, you can let anyone go on EastEnders, but do not let Wellard go. And as soon as John left the BBC, Wellard was gone within a year. Oh really? But it was actually beautiful the way they did it. It was like the the actual episode where Wellard passed away was lovely because they actually put. Uh, East 17 song over it. I think it was Stay Another Day. <laughs> and EastEnders never do that. It's very rare that you'll watch an episode where there's music over it. Very rare. They do it when someone like a matriarch, like a Peggy Mitchell leaves the show and they'll change the titles at the end. But very rarely will you hear a song played over a scene. And it was actually beautifully done. So in a way, it was nice that the, you know, I think it was Dominic at the time as the producer to say, look, 
it is a big character and let's pay homage to that and let's, you know, give that character a send off. It's a, I'm, a, I'm heavily allergic to dogs and I'm so like not dog and animal friendly. But while you've been talking about that now, I've been trying to ask myself if I could make myself dog friendly and, ha and hide it to, you know, to get 11 years on a soap opera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you, meant, you mentioned some of the big names in the show. I mean, who, who was a mentor to you? You know, who, who kind of took you under your wing dur during the time you were I there? I think, I mean, I was quite fortunate to, to kind of be, I suppose, a popular member of cast without not, not being a big-headed statement. But I was kind of always in different friendship groups there. And, you know, Steve McFadden, who plays Phil, you know, really took me under his wing. And I remember, you know... We'd gone on a PA together, or we'd gone to you know various functions together. We'd gone out for dinner, and even I was sat there going, "You know, I'm sat here with Phil Mitchell." I mean, it's you know he's created a character that's synonymous with with you know Great Britain, and he's and he's and he's you know everyone's like, oh, what's that Phil Mitchell like, or what's Grant Mitchell like? There's a lot of characters these days that just come in and they just forget about them the next day because they're just not that they're miscellaneous, but they're just not they haven't necessarily caused you know, a, a big wave on the show, but someone like a, a Grant Mitchell, you know, self-explanatory, really. Well, listen, Dean, we're going to go from acting to five-a-side football, so you, 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 and I need to, uh, you and I need to go and get changed and lace up our boots. Thanks a lot for being here. It's, it's, uh, it's been good to, good to chat. Um, I always like chatting uh, with, uh, with people I'm friends with anyway because I always find it a, a much more relaxing, yeah. e e easy, easy dynamic. But uh, thanks a lot for being here, buddy. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do a round two at some point in the future. Thanks for having me. Guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, as always. If you've liked... Please make sure you do press like on YouTube or press subscribe if you don't already subscribe. If you've been watching the video, you can always get the audio version on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you want to listen to your podcasts. And as always, I'm the Matt Haycox. That's T-H-E-M-A-T-T-H-A-Y-C-O-X on all my social channels. So make sure you give me a follow, and I'll see you again in a future episode. <laughs>